I'm not gonna lie to you champs. I debated for hours if I should make this video, but with everyone else not really giving a fuck recently, then why should I, I guess? So Dragon Ball Super Superhero is out, kinda. The Japanese release on June 10th set the internet ablaze as Gohan, Pan, and Piccolo stole the show in an iconic cinema that most of us have yet to see ourselves. I will warn you guys right now one more time even though it is plastered everywhere, that this is your final spoiler warning. We're gonna talk about the real, the fake, and everything in between, so if you're crazy enough to think that you can avoid spoilers for two more months, then be my guest, but if you don't have time for that, then let's get going. Dragon Ball Super Superhero, the latest addition to the Dragon Ball franchise's cinema catalog, recently released overseas as the film centered around the Red Ribbon Army's involvement, Gohan, yes, Gohan and his family, but I think most significantly we should all know to go into this movie not expecting a historic battle featuring Goku and Vegeta this time around. I know there's probably plenty of you guys out there that agree with this as well and you know me I would love to spare myself of the spoilers for this movie because I want to go in blind and enjoy it but that's just not the current climate we're in so you gotta do what you gotta do so these spoilers are gonna be coming straight from the homie DBS Chronicles and we will be going over the entire summary on the Dragon Ball Super superhero movie from Reddit created by Cypher so be sure to go follow them their links will be down below in the description so before we get into Gohan, and trust me, we will get there very soon, first I should introduce you all to the new genius scientist of the Red Ribbon Army, Dr. Hito. Though employed through his front company, Red Pharmaceuticals, Dr. Hito is known as the creator of the two twin androids we come to meet, Gamma 1 and Gamma 2, and the primary antagonist of the new film. This is the president of Red Pharmaceuticals, Magenta, and one of the first things we learned about him is that his goal is to rebuild the Red Ribbon Army. So right away, we have our two main antagonists for Superhero, but as I'm sure you've seen by now, there are some other interesting characters as well. Four others that I have in mind to be exact, but starting off, we're introduced again to the two androids, Gamma 1 and 2. And since we've already talked about them before, we already really know what to expect. The movie pretty much starts off with a recap of and history of Goku's battles against the Red Ribbon Army, the androids, and even Cell. After the history lesson, we cut to Hachimaru, Dr. Hito's B-shaped spy robot that's following Carmine's car into the Red Ribbon compound, hidden away under a holographic lake slash basin thing. Carmine delivers a video presentation on Dr. Hito to Magenta, and Carmine, by the way, is Magenta's main confidant and his chauffeur, who of course is also employed by the Red Ribbon Army. In the video, we see a brief family tree for Dr. Jiro, including Vomi, whom we know as Android 21 from Dragon Ball Fighters, but here her name is Vomi, and then we see Jivo, or number 16, but there's also an unseen second child who is one of Dr. Hito's parents. The whole family tree is displayed as Magenta asks if he's a doctor in an academic or medical sense, to which Carmine replies he has credentials in both. Unable to find steady work in laboratories due to his controversial research, Dr. Hito is currently incarcerated for having exhumed several bodies to turn into androids and have him run a convenience store for him in order to shore up research funds. Magenta and Carmine decide to meet him outside the prison upon his release, and Dr. Hito gets out of prison dressed in a superhero style kind of onesie and a cape, as inmates are seen heckling and tossing garbage at him from behind the gates. He tosses a bomb into the gates behind him, which explodes once he's a short distance away. Carmine and Magenta pull up in a car and invite him in, and this is when he reveals that he already knows who they are and he had been spying on them using his robot to trail them ever since Carmine first came sniffing around the prison. Before we go any further however, just so there is no confusion, Cypher was able to see the movie but wrote the summary afterwards with no reference material in front of them, so some details may be sort of out of order here and there. People like Cypher and Goresh have already seen the film themselves though, so they are reliable sources that others in the community are trusting as well. Also, for Superhero, I think we can get this video to 5,000 likes. Let's shoot for that, guys. In the car, Magenta proposes that Hito come work for them, but Hito is reluctant at first, knowing that Red Pharmaceuticals is just a front for the Red Ribbon Army. His grandfather's connection to them caused trouble for his parents and him. 
Although he's interested in their generous research salary, he already takes issue with their super villainous aims of world domination. Carmine attempts to threaten Hida with a handgun, but Hida reveals that he's injected himself with a serum that's toughened his skin to withstand a certain degree of shock, which also helped him avoid being bullied in prison. In addition, Hachimaru, which lives in a compartment on his glove, carries a lethal sting that even cyborgs aren't immune to, so long as there's still some element of their human biology left intact. This also helped him ensure that any would-be bullies in prison died under mysterious circumstances, quote unquote. Magenta appeals to his sense of superheroics and informs him that they believe Capsule Corporation is serving as the headquarters for a collection of aliens set on world domination themselves, and that the androids and Cell were part of a plan to stop them. He pulls out footage of Frieza vs Trunks as proof. Carmine then begins playing some triumphant superhero music on the car stereo to set the atmosphere and Hito finally gets on board. He agrees to contribute his research in hopes of creating the ultimate android superheroes. Six months later, however, we finally see things starting to kick off in the film as Pan is seen training with Piccolo in the woods. She wants to learn how to fly and shoot energy blasts like Uncle Goten and the others, but Piccolo tries to explain to her that she has to master the basics first. She struggles with attempting to fly for a bit, but fails to get off the ground. Piccolo assures her it's nothing to worry about and will come in time. She is only three after all. Plus, she has the blood of a Saiyan, so it'll come. Pan asks if it's true her father could really be stronger than her grandpa, as she's never seen Gohan fight. Of course, Piccolo says that he could be, but he isn't so sure about him with how he is right now. Pan runs off to kindergarten at super speed and Piccolo returns to his house. Soon after, Piccolo gets a call from Videl asking him to pick Pan up from kindergarten as she's busy preparing her martial arts school for a tournament and Gohan is neck deep in his research for an important presentation. She offers him food but Piccolo reminds her that he only drinks water funnily enough. I'm not sure if that's a detail that's always been known about Namekians or just Piccolo in general, but that is hilarious, so she promises him a nice stuffed animal instead. Piccolo pays Gohan a visit at Gohan and Videl's home and questions his inability to go pick up Pan. Like, what, what are you doing? I'm guessing this is where that screenshot of Gohan at his door talking to Piccolo with his glasses and his crazy hair came from, because as Gohan goes on to talk about how busy he is with his research, he explains that they found an ant who can turn golden and strengthen itself in times of danger, just like Super Saiyan. Piccolo still does not care, however, like, why will you not go pick your daughter up, son? He asks him if his research is more important than his family and implores him to at least train a little sometimes, as they never know when new threats might show up. Gohan protests the need to keep training as things are peaceful right now and besides, if worse comes to worse, Goku and Vegeta are around. Piccolo throws a punch at Gohan who blocks it. He hasn't gotten that rusty yet, but Piccolo socks him in the stomach still with another blow, then changes Gohan's clothes into his traditional Piccolo gi and weighted cape. Gohan collapses under the weight of all of this as Piccolo encourages him to keep it on, although Gohan argues that it makes it hard to work. Piccolo eventually agrees to pick up Pan and Gohan promises him some more stuffed animals as payment again. Piccolo tries to return to his home to meditate only to be attacked by Gamma number two. He immediately recognizes Gamma as an android from his lack of key and the red ribbon logo on him. Piccolo asks who he is, but Gamma number two dramatically reveals that this must remain a secret for the time being. Gamma number two calls him Demon King Piccolo, however, to which Piccolo protests that his name is just Piccolo. Gamma two asks what that's supposed to mean, but he isn't telling. Piccolo also mentions that he remembers the Red Ribbon Army from back when he was a god, as Gamma two has questions about that as well, but Piccolo won't reveal any more information. Gamma 2 tells Piccolo that he's just decided to alter his mission objective from subjugate target to kill now. These two engage in a short fight as Gamma 2 believes that he's killed Piccolo with a blast and leaves. Piccolo, however, having just managed to dodge Gamma 2's attack and slip away into the dust clouds, trails the android back to the red ribbon base. Piccolo subdues a guard and steals his form as a disguise and then follows Gamma 2 to a control room where Magenta, Carmine, Hito, and the two Gammas are holding a meeting with a number of soldiers standing guard. Gamma number one chastises Gamma two for not confirming the body and reveals a faint figure escaping from the smoke via the camera footage, which of course would be Piccolo. 
Magenta is frustrated as well, as if this blunder reveals their plan to the enemy too quickly, they'll have to hasten everything. He orders Dr. Hito to finish his work on Cell Max, and we're gonna get into that one soon as well. But Hito insists that the two Gammas can finish the job on their own. Carmine isn't so sure and runs down the list of threatening, stronger opponents who remain, such as Goku, Vegeta, Majin Buu, and even Hercule, whose true strength to them remains unknown, but we know what's up with the world's strongest champion. In addition, there's also information on Son Gohan, who they have reason to suspect killed the original Cell rather than Hercule. Dr. Hito is reluctant to activate Cell Max, both for his non-heroic appearance and the fact that he doesn't like having relied on his grandfather's research to make him. In addition, his control system isn't finished, meaning he could easily turn on all of them at any second. Overhearing the conversation about Cell Max, Piccolo slips away thankfully to contact Boma by phone. He asks if Goku and Vegeta are around, but they're off training with Beerus. He asks Boma to contact Whis, as in the meantime, he goes to Corrin's for Sensu Beans. So now, fellas, we get to Beerus's planet in the God Realm, yes sir! And Broly and Goku are already engaged in a training match right away. They're both in their base forms, unfortunately, but Broly starts to get carried away and unleashes his green key again, which causes Goku to ask him to back down a little bit. He has to learn to control that still. Broly powers down and apologizes. Meanwhile, Vegeta has been meditating by himself for some time. Goku chastises himself for being so lazy with a number of strong goalposts still out there like Jiren, the gods of destruction, etc. But Vegeta says that this is also a form of training as well. He asks if Goku noticed that at the Tournament of Power, there in Jiren's gap in power may not have been so great in the traditional sense. However, Jiren was able to save all of his energy for specific instances of attacks. This allowed him to put out greater offensive power while also saving his strength in the end. He's focusing on becoming able to fight the same way. Whis applauds Vegeta for finally catching on and proposes a training match. Vegeta refuses if Broly will be participating as they'll all be in trouble if he gets carried away again. Whis instead has Broly watch so he can see a battle in which the two fighters are controlling their own power and has Goku and Vegeta fight without transformations, energy attacks, or specialized powers, meaning no Ultra Ego and no Ultra Instinct. Beerus, meanwhile, has finally woken up from four months of slumber and found the trio of Limo, Chile, and Broly living on his planet now. Goku offers that this was the best way to keep Broly safe from Frieza, so Beerus allows Limo to stay after sampling some of his cooking, so you know, that's the only way to win Beerus over. He uh, <laughs> allows Chile to stay because he finds her cute, as Whis notes that he has rather cliche taste. Goku, of course, wants to have a meal before the match begins, so the group go off to have an elaborate dinner courtesy of Limo. After having Limo's cooking, Whis is fired as chef now, as Limo might be having to stay here full time. Beerus, Limo, Chile, and Whis settle in with some tubs of Earth's ice cream to watch the fight unfold, as Broly watches intensely as well. During the match, an ice cream tub flies onto the top of Whis's staff, preventing him from noticing Boma's call, so back on Earth, they have no idea this is going on and vice versa, as Corrin offers Piccolo the only two sensu beans he has left at the moment. Piccolo gets a call back from Boma saying she's had no luck contacting Whis as they're all busy watching the sparring match. Piccolo goes through the list of other potential recruits. Majin Buu seems to be hibernating. There's androids 17 and 18 who carry the risk of the Red Ribbon Army knowing some sort of weakness for them, so that may be out and Gohan, who seems to not be able to be ready in time. He'll have to do something himself then, I guess, Piccolo says, as he recalls the Namekian Elder having unlocked Gohan and Krillin's potential, and flies up to Dende to ask Dende if he can perform a similar process for him. Dende says that, unfortunately, he can't. Only Namekians of a certain age have that ability, but he could upgrade the Dragon Balls to be able to do so. This is when Dende pulls out some water in the Shinron statue and performs an upgrade ritual. Piccolo confirms that he had no idea you could do things like that back when he was a god, but Dende notes that Piccolo slash Kami left Namek a long time ago. Piccolo is worried about collecting the Dragon Balls in time, but Dende notes that Boma likely already has them gathered. She's been gathering and using them for small, trivial wishes periodically to keep them inactive and prevent them from falling into the wrong hands. That's a pretty smart idea, actually. Piccolo then flies down to go meet Boma. 
at Capsule Corp, Piccolo takes the first wish and asks Shenron to unlock his latent potential. Shenron does so, dropping a mirror down so he can see his new appearance change and notes that he also threw in a little extra as a bonus. So here goes our new Piccolo form with a little, you know, extra something something from Shenron. Boma takes the next two wishes and I'm not mad at her at all. She got her little BBL, you know, Boma's looking good. She got, you know, some eyelash volume. I'm digging it. Vegeta, he's about to come back happy, okay? Piccolo berates her for using the wishes for such trivial requests, but like then they said, I mean, this is just how we're keeping the Dragon Balls out of the evildoer's hand. When Piccolo chastises her again, she points out that he's only mad because he didn't think of it first and he sheepishly flies back to Red Ribbon HQ. Back at the base, eager to hasten their plans, Magenta and Carmine devise a plan to lure in son Gohan next and have the Gammas finish him off. Knowing he has a daughter, they decide to kidnap her to lure him to the base, to avoid unveiling themselves to the public just yet. Piccolo, still in his red ribbon uniform, sneaks back in and makes the excuse that he slipped away to the toilet. His neighboring soldier asks if he's okay, he looks kinda green, and tells him to let him know before it becomes an emergency. Piccolo volunteers himself to go on the mission to kidnap Pan as he happens to live in the area and is also familiar with Pan as she's somewhat a local celebrity, he tells them, being Hercule's granddaughter and all that. Obliging his request, Piccolo is paired up with a big burly soldier called number 15 for the mission. Piccolo figures that going through with a stage kidnapping may be just what it takes to snap Gohan back into action. Seeing Piccolo's distress over going through with the plan, number 15 says he knows about his stomach issues and to please just hold it until they land. 15 arrives at Pan's kindergarten but is instantly knocked unconscious by Pan when he tries to claim that he's here to take her home. Pan does recognize Piccolo by his key however, so he takes her and the unconscious 15 back into the red ribbon plane, explaining to the kindergarten teacher that this is just a security drill for Pan. Inside the plane, Piccolo reveals his plan about Gohan to her, putting her in handcuffs even though they both know she can easily break out of them, and delivers her to the red ribbon base. Pan displays her terror in a recording the Red Ribbon's plan to use Lord Gohan in, and Piccolo and number 15 show up at Gohan's house to deliver the message. Despite Pan having seen through his disguise right away, Piccolo is disappointed to see that Gohan doesn't notice. Gohan is completely unbothered, however, by 15 holding him at gunpoint, effortlessly flicking the weapon out of his hand and asking him to get out of here, until 15 pulls out the footage of Pan. As soon as he hears this, Gohan flies out of the window at full speed and powers up the Super Saiyan, creating a massive crater under a wing of his home that causes the whole house to topple. In a panic, number 15 apologizes and politely asks Gohan to just come along with him, ensuring him that Pan is still unharmed. Gohan arrives at the base and immediately rushes towards Pan, who is waiting at the top of the tower behind a crowd of soldiers, the higher-ups, and the Gammas. Gamma number 1 engages in battle with him right away. Gohan is fighting an uphill battle as a Super Saiyan 2 until Pan and Piccolo feign a performance in which he acts like he's a soldier lifting her up by the collar and threatening her. Gohan then goes ultimate and begins to gain the upper hand here. Piccolo and Pan are both surprised by the Gamma's protesting of Piccolo harming Pan, but Gamma 2 is ordered into the fight as backup, but Piccolo intervenes to stop him using his new awakened form for the first time. Gamma 2 reveals he still has more power left and puts Piccolo on the back foot again. Momentarily defeated and falling into a crevice in the base, Piccolo remembers Shenron's words about throwing in a little bonus. A symbol illuminates on Piccolo's back as his skin turns reddish orange, his antenna begin to stand on end and he grows a lot bulkier. In this newer, even stronger form, Piccolo flies back up and quickly puts Gamma 2 down in his second new form this movie. Pan breaks free of her cuffs and begins plowing through the Red Ribbon soldiers, with Magenta and Carmine seeing that the Gammas are losing and start to retreat. Threatened by three-year-old Pan somehow, Carmine starts firing his gun at her, with Pan fortunately dodging all the shots of course. Outraged at Carmine's actions, the Gammas finally realize that they've been had and cease their fight with Gohan and Piccolo. Pan knocks out Carmine while Magenta slips away and Dr. Hito follows him. The battle is seemingly over now, everyone regroups, now with the Gammas in tow. Boma arrives, having Trunks, Goten, Krillin, and 18 as backup, with Piccolo surprised to see Goten and Trunks have grown so much since they last met. Gohan notes that Saiyans actually remain pretty small until they hit a certain age, at which point they have a radical growth spurt. 
Gohan starts to search around for his glasses as Piccolo asks if his eyesight gets better when he transforms. Huh. Interesting. Magenta prepares to awaken Cell Max as Dr. Hito tries to intervene. Magenta shoots Dr. Hito, a moment he'd been waiting for apparently, and begins to undo more of Cell Max's restraints. Dr. Hito gets up, reminding him about the serum that toughened his skin, as Magenta reveals that he's gone through some upgrades as well. He removes his jacket and shirt to show the cybernetically enhanced body underneath. As the two prepare to fight, he's stung on the back of the neck by Hachimaru whose poison begins killing him. While Hito glows, Magenta uses his last moments to finally undo the locks on Cell Max. So Cell Max is real and Cell Max is definitely here guys. I'm sure by now you've all seen the art of the screenshots going around of this new red version of Cell. That is the final boss of Dragon Ball Super Superhero. While Cell Max continues to break free from his chamber, Gohan goes on to ask Piccolo what's up with this new form he's showing. But Piccolo knows that Shenron was just really generous with his bonuses. Gohan asks him to give it a name, kind of like Super Saiyan. Being told by Gohan that he was orange, he himself hadn't realized it yet. Piccolo doesn't know what he looks like. He arbitrarily decides on orange Piccolo, I guess, playing it sort of as a bit of a joke. The sky darkens and this is when Cell Max, a gigantic red creature resembling second form Cell with wings, explodes from right below the base. Gamma once shields an unconscious Dr. Hito from the explosion and sensing the fight to come, Piccolo tosses one of the sensu beans to Gohan ahead of time, but he fails to catch it without his glasses, no! Allowing it to fall into the crevices. So now the raid fight begins as Goten, Trunks, 18, the Gammas, Piccolo, and Gohan fly into combat against Cell Max, while Krillin stays back with Pan and Bone. Still tired from his previous battle, however, Gohan can only go Super Saiyan 1 or 2 at the moment, it's kinda hard to tell. The Gammas reveal that Dr. Hito has built a weakness in the top of Cell Max's head. They'll have to penetrate it to kill him. However, doing so will also trigger an explosion that they're unlikely to survive. Still though, the gang's resolve is to aim for his head. With no one really able to make much collective progress and Cell Max shrugging off even a special beam cannon from Piccolo aimed directly at his weak spot, Goten and Trunks attempt to fuse now. They slip up producing the fat version of Gotenks as Gotenks attempts to go Super Saiyan but fails. After being pinballed around from Cell Max to several other characters, he headbutts Cell Max directly on his weak point, producing some cracks on Cell Max's head finally. Piccolo can't even help but note that this is the first time a failed fusion has ever been useful. Gamma 2 plans to sacrifice himself to deliver the final blow, gathering all of his energy from above and driving himself through Cell Max. With the cooperation of the rest of the team, Cell Max is put into a position for the charged up Gamma to strike, but he's blocked at the last second, only managing to take off Cell Max's arm. To escape the resulting explosion, Pan learns to fly out of nowhere. Enraged by this, however, Cell Max tries to stomp the unconscious Dr. Hito and Gamma 2's lifeless bodies, but Piccolo intervenes, returning to his orange form to hold up Cell Max's foot. This is when Krillin actually is a pretty good idea though as he reminds Piccolo about his gigantification technique from the 23rd World Tournament and encourages him to use it with his powers now. Krillin is a genius. Grown giant but still in a tough fight with Cell Max, Piccolo puts his hopes in Gohan telling him that he'll hold Cell Max in place long enough for Gohan to get in one full power attack on his weak point. He offers Gohan the last sensu beam, having some difficulty finding it in his belt now that he's grown to such giant size. But Piccolo goes on to engage in an uphill battle with a one-armed Cell Max with the support from the others while Gohan charges his power. Cell Max manages an attack that seems as if he's killed Piccolo, causing Gohan to awaken further past Ultimate, finally into his new form resembling Super Saiyan 2 with longer spikier hair, a more pronounced bang, and red sparks with white hair and red iris black pupiled eyes, and this fellas would be the birth of final Gohan. Now I know those of you that got spoiled much like myself on Gohan's new form a day or so ago have probably seen this edited picture with white hair and red eyes. Well this one is an edit of another still shot that was captured in the movie so this one isn't real. 
However, there are plenty of screenshots of Gohan's new form floating around the internet. It just isn't literal Gohan Blanco idea, you know? Gohan lays some pretty solid attacks into Cell Max, overwhelming him. Cell Max then begins charging a massive, nearly Earth-sized ball of energy in the sky, which he collapses into one concentrated attack. Piccolo recovers and continues holding Cell Max in place as Cell Max tosses his energy ball, but Gohan performs his own special beam cannon, running straight through both Cell Max's attack and his head. Cell Max falls to the ground and explodes while the gang retreats from the blast, and in the aftermath, Pan runs up to Gohan and Piccolo in their new white and orange forms respectively, being surprised by their appearances before they revert back to normal. Gohan and Pan embrace as Piccolo congratulates Gohan, with Gohan noting that even had his father and Vegeta been around, they may not have been able to defeat Cell Max, so that just goes to show you how strong this boss of a character was in this movie. Piccolo says that that's exactly why it's important for Gohan to stay prepared. Gamma 2's body, while drained of energy, disintegrates as Dr. Hito and Gamma 1 watch. Piccolo states that in the end, Gamma 2 really was a superhero. Dr. Hito rejects this, however, saying that they're all the ones that are heroes. He's repentant, but also states that he knew he was being used and chose not to care. Roma offers the repentant Dr. Hito and Gamma 1 places at Capsule Corporation, to which Dr. Hito's skin serum could probably prove useful in cosmetic research. Pan happily flies around everyone as we cut to the final credits of the movie, and that is Dragon Ball Super Super Hero. However, in the post credit scenes, we then go on to see Goku and Vegeta, who are both so exhausted that they can hardly move after finishing their fight finally, which, by the way, took the whole movie. Vegeta tosses a slow-moving but weak punch into Goku, who finally topples over, followed shortly by Vegeta. Vegeta happily remarks that, yes, you guys heard me. Goku fell first, so Vegeta won. We gonna take those. Beerus has fallen asleep as Chile is happy that this dull fight is finally over, but Limo and Broly have been moved to tears as the credits close, and that is from the eyes of someone who has seen the movie themselves. Don't forget to subscribe and also be sure to have those notifications turned on, guys. You do not want to miss more Dragon Ball content as soon as it's uploaded. Also, don't forget to follow DBS Chronicles. And if you want to see the summary for yourselves, the link to Cypher's post will be in the description as well. So be sure to go check it out. But anyways, have a great, great day and I'll see you all in the next one.